Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, we just wanted to thank the conference organizers and the presenters for a wonderful conference so far. And thank you to all the health literacy professionals out there who've been working so hard during this pandemic. We really appreciate you. Um, our panelists are coming from the Northeast and we're interested to know where you are. So please post your location in the discussion section. I am Dr. Michelle Diabundo, and I am joining you today from beautiful Belmar, New Jersey, and it is a beach day, just so you know, <laughs> and I'll be serving as the moderator for today's panel. We'll be discussing health literacy and clinical trial recruitment in underserved populations, including individual and systemic barriers to participation and how those challenges can be addressed. This sec session will be about 45 minutes of panel discussion, followed by 15 minutes of question and answers. So please post your questions throughout the session and we will do our best to answer them at the end. As an introduction, our panelists will speak about their backgrounds in clinical trial recruitment and health literacy. And we'll get started with Michael today. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael L. Blizzard. It is a pleasure to be one of the panelists this afternoon to discuss, to discuss literacy, health literacy role in diversifying clinical trials. By definition, health literacy means people have the capacity to obtain uh, uh, process and understand basic health information and services needed to make appropriate healthcare decisions. So how do we get this information about health literacy about uh, into clinical trials, into clinics, hospitals, uh, barbershops, sporting events, and mosques in these underrepresented communities? Um, the key lies with pharma, academia, and utilizing um, technology and a relentless commitment by all the panelists um, this afternoon assembled. So by way of background, um, I've been serving in clinical research for the past decade. I uh, serve at, uh, as the Oncology Research Administrator for New Jersey Urology. I presented at numerous places in terms of clinical research. Um, how do we get more underrepresented uh, communities in, re in clinical research and by way of education? I have my honors in uh, psychology and biology at William Patterson, uh, study for my uh, master's of science degree in research ethics at Union Graduate County and Mount Sinai School of Medicine, and I'm an aspiring uh, PhD student. So with that being said, you're back in the hands of the moderator. And we are moving on to Becky. Hi, everybody. My name is Becky Johnson. I have spent the last several years in clinical research, um, specifically in patient recruitment strategy, as well as diversity and inclusion. And I have been engaged on the topic of um, diversifying clinical trials for many years now, both personally and professionally. My doctoral dissertation uh, was I was exploring how we can improve access through socioecological factors that are involved when, when research sites are purposeful in recruiting racially and ethnically diverse clinical trial participants. And in my current role at IQVIA, I counsel, study, and sponsor teams on how to incorporate diversity and inclusion in their trials and their clinical development programs. And so this includes implementing strategies that ensure that we're being inclusive with our outreach efforts, as, as Michael had, had mentioned, and, and that we're raising awareness and educating potential trial participants in the most appropriate ways. Thank you, Becky. And our other panelist is Sylvia. Hi everyone, my name is Sylvia Badorf cassis and I'm actually a program manager at a research and policy center in academia in Boston, Massachusetts. And I have a bachelor of science in psychology and a master's in public health and global health. And I've been in clinical trials and clinical research for about 20 years now, having worked in autism research when I first came out of college and then moved on to working in oncology and in uh, neurology as well. Um, and have had spent some time as well in uh, the IRB role, ethics board role. So I've sort of seen research from multiple different perspectives over the years. Um, and eventually I've moved into this current role that I'm in now and I've spent the last uh, three years 
really focused on health literacy in clinical research and how we can make trials more understandable and accessible to patients and potential participants. And I'm really just thrilled to be part of this panel, this esteemed group who's all been working on this issue from multiple different perspectives. So thank you and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you all. And um, hello to Texas, Ohio, DC, Florida, North Carolina, Oregon, Michigan, and California. Thank you for joining us. Um, again, I'm Dr. Michelle Diabundo and I'm associate professor in the PhD program in health sciences at Seton Hall University. And I'm proud to say that Dr. Becky Johnson is one of my former students and graduated last year. Um, I have the honor of being introduced to this topic of diversifying clinical trial participation through my service on dissertation committees. And since then I've been involved in the topic through co-authoring publications and um, doing research I'm currently working on quality of life and physical activity research during COVID-19 and also working on a community needs assessment. Um, and I'm very excited to be moderating today's discussion. So to get started, my first question is, how is recruitment for underrepresented populations and health literacy related? Yeah. So Generally speaking, members of traditionally underrepresented populations disproportionately have limited health literacy skills. And so we need to consider this with our recruitment outreach strategy and our messaging that we're putting into place um, because individuals with limited health literacy tend to have less knowledge about their condition or how to manage their disease, which means they're less likely to use preventive services or access the healthcare system, which then makes them less likely to be aware of clinical trials. And so we need to look at, are we reaching the right areas with our outreach efforts and, and incorporate strategies for community engagement? We hear often that we need to, you know, community engagement is very important for building trust, but it's also critical for increasing awareness and providing education um, when we're thinking about health literacy as well. And then we need to um, communicate about a trial in a way that's going to resonate not only culturally, but from a health literacy standpoint in that are we providing information in a way that a patient understands and can use for making an informed decision about participation. So when we're at the point when we're discussing the potential for an individual to join a clinical trial, being able to ensure that this individual fully understands the study information being discussed during the informed consent process. So we know limited health literacy exists in underserved communities. And we wanted to move into the next session and talk about barriers for participation before the panel speaks to that, we wanted to hear from the audience in the discussion section about what you feel are barriers to participating in clinical trials. And then we'll talk about that after our panelists discuss this. So what are some barriers for individuals participating in clinical trials? Yes, yeah, so that's what I've noticed um, during my time as uh, in research at healthcare just access to healthcare is a particular barrier. Currently, right now, there are 10.9% of Americans who are still uninsured. So healthcare is one. Also, information about clinical trials. You know, there are certain segments in these rural areas that have lack of um, internet access and broadband. And most of these uh, individuals have not even heard of clinicaltrials.gov. Transportation is another issue. Oftentimes these facilities are located, you know, half an hour to an hour away. Um, also to means to get there, funds to get there, which is limited in these underrepresented communities. And also um, uh, Uber, could we maybe link in the future Uber with clinical trials to pick up some of these patients and bring them to clinical to the clinical uh, facilities. Childcare is another one, especially if we're targeting single mothers, that's another, another issue, you know, who's going to you know, watch the kid and, and these facilities aren't designed for a, a three-year-old toddler. Also time off from work is another one. Most of these uh, patients are allergy, uh, hourly wage, wage earners. So therefore if they're at the clinic for, for two to three hours, then that is a particular barrier. So that segues into my other point. 
visits. Sometimes he's, you know, I, I know a lot of these trials of visits could be up to three to four hours. So if you're an hourly wage, wage earner, that's, that's tough. Another one is scheduling conflicts, you know. Yeah. So most of these uh, clinic hours are nine to five and some patients, you know, potential candidates, they work early in the morning and get up late in the afternoon. And one thing that I would like to explore as well too is Saturday, uh, Saturday options. I believe we adopt that, but that'd be uh, something that we discuss as well in the panel. Also to distrust, you know, distrust in the government, distrust in healthcare. You know, just distrust in the system, and then, and, and the last thing I want to uh, mention is in that institutional racism, even in, you know, in clinical trials. So there's a few other barriers that I want to talk about. But I just think that those, uh, for me, are the main ones. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Michael, um, for giving us a good list of individual barriers to participating in clinical trials for underserved populations. What about the systemic barriers to participation in clinical trials? Well, when I think about systemic barriers, I often try to think like from like a funnel perspective, um, the macro to the micro. And I mean, there's so many that we could list off, but one of the ones that I think about is just lack of investment overall in communities where research takes place. Um, without having um, a presence of research and healthcare professionals, but predominantly research professionals and those sort of out in the community, letting people know what research is, how it's already um, in their community, how it's already benefiting potentially their community, means like to Michael's point, there's decreased trust um, and it doesn't make it doesn't make it seem like research is a priority or a regular activity, right? So it feels like this exceptionalism that people are helicoptering in and helicoptering out to do research. And so it raises questions and suspicion sometimes um, when researchers do show up in the community. So the idea of investing in communities and getting to know communities and being present in the community is key in terms of addressing systemic barriers. Also getting rid of um, thinking about getting input from communities on the studies that are being done, right? And how um, can research actually matters to various individuals within communities is important because we wanna make sure that we have research designs that actually work for participants. We wanna have study questions that are meaningful to participants. And that really only can happen with getting engagement of patients and community members and, and potential participants early on in the process to make sure we're asking and answering questions that really matter. And another thing then getting more micro is just the language we use in clinical research materials, right? Scientific, technical, um, jargony, um, they're not necessarily inclusive. Sometimes they're even stigmatizing. And we've had examples of um, one particular research study where an individual uh, investigator was really not interested in getting input from the community and used some mental health terminology in the materials that were provided that was really not appropriate and stigmatizing. It ended up being negative for the research, for the community, for himself. It was just not really an ideal situation. So really, as much as we can get input, from individuals on the materials themselves, we can really improve the experience of research. So, I mean, we really need unique strategies that are driven by regional variations in healthcare delivery, cultural beliefs, health beliefs, um, to Michael's point, broadband access. I mean, not it's not a one size fits all in terms of getting access to research for everyone, but we need to think about where we're doing research, where the populations are, and how we can really reinforce access, understanding, and inclusion. Yeah, and, and building on what Sylvia just mentioned about building on investing in communities, um, individuals in underrepresented communities are simply not asked as often to participate or, or offered participation, and that could be for several reasons. Oftentimes, the investigator perceives that they're not going to be eligible or that they're not going to take their med study medication. Um, and it could be the way that the protocol is designed and, and they're excluded because of the protocol eligibility criteria, because oftentimes um, they present at later stages of their disease. Um, and again, you know, like Sylvia mentions, a physician and really build up um, healthcare professional knowledge and, and have them be advocating for their patients to join a study. Um, and then the other thing is, is really there's, we're seeing angst at the study team level that there's concern um, that, you know, if we need to focus on recruitment of diverse individuals that will be increasing our cost and our timelines to our studies. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. So we have looked at the individual barriers and we've looked at systemic barriers. So let's shift into how to address them. What are the strategies for addressing barriers at the individual level for participating in clinical trials? Well, it has been my practice that um, the patients, give the patients adequate time to take the informed consent home and review it with their family, friends, trusted confidant, because it is a lot of information to digest. And you as the research personnel will be doing a disservice of not giving the patient adequate time to review the informed consent. And one thing I encourage is please have some questions for me, for the principal investigator. For an example, how many study visits? How long are the study visits? Any potential side effects? You know, what phase of the trial is this? Adverse events. So therefore, at least you can have a sense that there is some level of comprehension from the patient. And I believe from my experience that would help the patient to be more compliant to the study and also potentially completing the study as well. And when we're thinking about like individual level barriers and how to help promote access, I mean, the thing is that everyone can benefit from clear materials, um, understandable materials that are written at um, a, a lower grade level. It's not insulting. It's actually easier for everyone to understand. No one ever asks for something more complex. They want things that are easy to understand and accessible. And so one of the things that I've always when I was in my earlier days of clinical trial work, but also just thinking about coaching folks now is that we need to start thinking about integrating research into people's lives in a more holistic way. So what are the ways that we can um, address people's personal situations, whether they need childcare, whether they need transportation, whether they need time off work or a different kind of visit timings to be make, able to make it work. How can we discuss that in advance, make those expectations really clear and set people up for success, right? So we've seen this with the get out the vote campaign, right? If you make a plan to vote, you have your transportation, you know when you're gonna go, you know where your voting location is, you're more likely to show up, right? That's how we make our democracy work. So in this sort of situation, it's kind of similar. Like you wanna make sure people have a sense of what's gonna be expected of them. When are they gonna to need to do things and how can we as the research study team help them be successful in being in the study? Because most people don't sign up for a study and want to you know, not be part of it and, anymore unless they have like specific reasons for dropping out or leaving a study. But even failure to show up for visits or just being able not to not being able to fit it into their lives. Like we can help people make plans to be successful in research. Thank you. Purposefully engaging with individuals and communities is really important um, for the individual level. What about strategies for addressing the systemic barriers that exist? Again, it's investing in communities. The patients are typically hearing about a trial from their physicians. So we have to get more community-based physicians engage with research, um, provide them with resources and training to become investigators. And I know that a lot of organizations are really focused on this, especially right now. Um, you know, we're actively focus on, focusing on this need in, in trying to expand our reach um, to new community-based investigators that we don't already have partnerships with and, and help develop this network of investigators that have a trusted relationship in their communities with community members. Um, so that we can help partner with, you know, bring research to patients by partnering with them. And so we need to look at that and, and shift our site selection strategies towards selecting sites in the right communities that are going to allow wider access to these study centers. And, you know, we can do this. We now have all of this data, our medical data, prescription claims data, consumer data. So, so being able to combine all of this data um, we can really leverage it to be able to make the, the right connections with protocol eligible patients from most of the healthcare facilities in the US and, and then understanding where, you know, within the nearby communities of those healthcare facilities, these, these protocol eligible, eligible patients are. Um, so, 
So just because a patient, I'm sorry, just because a center actually has a patient population that we're looking for, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be experienced with research or that they're equipped to have the right conversations. And so sites may wanna consider on-site resourcing models um, or sponsors may wanna consider, you know, providing those to sites on studies where we can offer study coordinator resources. And, you know, so they're highly trained in clinical trials. They can carry out the same functions as the site staffs would themselves, but they're also community-based research staff. So they, they have the experience and, and the awareness of the local community um, culture. So they can kind of act as a conduit between the sites and their surrounding communities. And I think I might just add, you know, I, I think Becky's listed out like investing in communities is like one of my like my main points as well, but also the idea of just like the relationship building, which sometimes takes longer than we, I, well, we all know in real life relationship building takes work, right? But just in terms of our research and the work we want to do in, you know, to make a difference in communities, we have to kind of see the long view. So I, you know, in the work that I've been doing at the MRCT Center, we kind of built into this, the participant journey, the idea that there's this discovery phase at the beginning, like the discovery phase of when you learn about research for the first time, when you're given information about trials that are more broad so that you're understanding research in a more broad sense about how it's part of your, your regular life. And then you can build into um, individual recruitment. But I think people are more likely to um, accept research or understand research as a concept if they've sort of seen it or are more familiar with it. And we've seen with COVID-19, like there's so much research information out there now that there's definitely more um, awareness and understanding of research as a concept. And I think that's something to build off of, right? There's momentum here. People know about research. And this is sort of a way to help address some of those systemic barriers that are um, affecting some of our communities. And I would also just quickly add that, um, you know, to Michael's earlier point around institutionalized racism, like a systemic barrier, of course, is some of our own implicit biases. And so where as much as we can try to address those, there's, there's trainings, there's resources um, out there to help us recognize why we may not approach particular people or how feelings we have about specific things affect the way we interact with the with the world and that is really important in terms of being able to address how to move forward in an inclusive way into the research studies that we know we want to have out there to help patients right we're not intentionally trying to exclude people but we need to be aware of these um, sort of blind spots we have so that we can be more engaged in this inclusive process. Yes, uh, I want to build off Becky's and Sylvia's point. Um, annually, a tradition of mine is to help feed the homeless. So we talked about community engagement. I brought my father with me. And when I brought him with me, his whole trajectory has changed. He said, Michael, I cannot believe that there are this many people in our community that are going without something to eat. And right now, my dad is really advocating more now to how do we you know, bring resources you know, to this population. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. So developing effective materials and effective communication with our communities is so important. And it's a great lead in to the next question, which is really why we're all here. <laughs> Um, at a health literacy conference, which is how are health literacy principles used in the development of clinical trial recruitment materials? Well, I mean, this audience is an extremely informed audience, so I don't know I'm going to give a ton of um, new, new information here, except just thinking about it in the context of clinical trials. Like, when we worked on this health literacy and clinical research resource, which we have a website of, and you do, you should have access to a resource sheet that has some of the URLs that we've been discussing here. So you'll be able to look them up. But we really looked at health literacy in this like broad sense. And when you think about it in clinical research, we're talking about the use of plain language, right? That's a critical part of being able to make research materials understandable. Uh, num numeracy and numeric principles being explained in um, simple graphs and, and really thinking about how we present numeric information, uh, design 
design principles around how things are laid out. What are the sort of structural ways that you wanna have information presented? What images are you including or graphics? Um, cultural considerations are a part of re these creating recruitment materials, right? Like who is it that you're designing this for and what kinds of um, information might be important to them to be included in the recruitment material? And if you're including images, like who do you wanna show represented in those images to present an inclusive research environment that feels like, yes, people like me are participating in studies. Um, and then usability testing is a huge piece of health literacy in clinical research, I think, is the idea that you test um, your materials, at least even with one or two people outside of the research team, um, and ideally with people who are like your um, participant pool, so that you're getting a sense of how those materials are working for folks and if they're in fact having the, um, the sort of functioning the way you want them to and they have the intended consequences. And then lastly, any interactive techniques. So much of research um, is also interaction. And I know we're doing a lot of virtual interaction now and that's its own kind of process, but thinking about like how we are doing teach back or um, integrating um, conversation guides or questions and answers into our processes um, so that there's really an expectation around like it being a, a, a double-sided exchange, right? A two-way exchange. And we, as the research community, researchers are also learning from our participants, right? We're learning from them, um, even as we're doing consent processes, et cetera, that can inform the way we engage with future participants. So that's how I think about sort of health literacy in the, um, in the clinical trial recruitment material space. And again, there's, there's a resource sheet that you should be able to access with some of the additional resources there. Yes, and, and if that PDF is not available right now, we will send it out to you. I'm not sure if it was uploaded correctly. Um, so a lot of the things that Sylvia mentioned have been also discussed in other presentations like the teach back. Um, so how can we take all of these things and, and how can we improve communication with potential and even current clinical trial participants? How can we improve that communication? Well, I just wanna share something my former mentor Dr. John E. Rawls mentioned to me, he sat me down early in my career. He says, Mr. Blizzard, he says that if, uh, if you're trustworthy, the patient will be more likely to trust the program. So you have to be trustworthy. You have to believe in the program. You have to invest time and effort into it. Because in healthcare, it's not just simply a nine to five job. Because sometimes these visits can go on past five o'clock. Sometimes, you know, to accommodate a patient's schedule, you may have to come into the office at 7.30 or eight o'clock in the morning. So you have to truly be invested. And that's one of the greatest things that I learned from my um, former mentor on about how do we keep these patients engaged. Yeah, and I think that, you know, we also, as Sylvia had mentioned earlier, patient voice and incorporating patient voice into our planning. Mm -hmm. And who are we designing these trials for? Actually speaking with that population and getting feedback on the aspects of that trial or how best to recruit for the trial. What, what do these patients want to know? What would, what would resonate? Um, and then also having research staff complete cultural competency training. And you know, we know that the depth of cultural competency training kind of directly correlates with, with the ability and in, in, with enrolling um, members of diverse subpopulations. But what's interesting is that this training doesn't necessarily need to come from a formalized training program, an e-learning program. Um, some site staff have actually told me that they learn best by immersing themselves in their local communities. One woman told me that she started taking up line dancing. Um, so she just wanted to join the activities from, from the local community members to, to really understand um, you know, that local culture. So in, in one way, if that isn't available at sites, maybe hiring research um, support staff from your local community, and then they can help kind of, you know, have lunch and learns and, and just talk to each other during lunch. And so you can really start to understand and immerse yourself in the local culture. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah, I I would 
Oh, go ahead, Michael. No, go ahead, Sylvia. Go ahead, Sylvia. No, go. <laughs> ladies first, ladies first. All right. Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> I had already mentioned kind of thinking about um, conversation guides and use of teach back. And I think the other thing that you can kind of um, integrate into improving sort of communications with trial participants and current participants is just thinking about where are the touch points where we can support participation again? What is the information that they might need along the way, particularly in longer term studies that can really um, help people again, remember the goals of the study, the reasons that they're in the study, the, the value of their participation and why they're in the study. I think that is there, we get so into the zone of doing the study that we may kind of forget that and I don't know that we forget, but like that we may not fully appreciate that there are actual people coming to the study site or in the trial, like giving us their data, taking their time to, to be part of it. And so just to kind of having those like really um, sort of those touch points along the way to, to build those relationships over time, I think goes a long way. And, and again, that trustworthiness that, that Michael was talking about as well. So now, Michael, you go. <laughs> I, I just wanted to mention um, uh, a while ago, a, a, a patient had brought his entire family um, to the visit to meet me. Uh, it, 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 that just speaks to what I was taught by my former mentor. Um, it was it was a magical moment because you know you got the, the spouse, you got the three kids, and then you had the grandma there as well too, and everybody wanted to meet Michael. So I, again, investing in the community, that you know, being involved, and it, it, it definitely will speak for itself. So it's still a moving moment for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, those personal moments are so important in building that trust. And we've talked a little bit about, a lot actually, about improving health literacy and communication in recruitment. But there's other aspects of this. So what about retaining participants once they're in a clinical trial? Obviously, for me, keeping the patient updated with any relevant uh, research news, uh, simple gestures like an email and a phone call goes a long way. And one thing that I started implementing is milestone celebration. So if the patient completes uh, three months, six months, or nine months, or uh, 12 months, we do a little milestone celebration. So yeah, so the patients are looking for, hey, Michael, it's nine months. I got three more months to go. What am I going to get? You ain't going to get a go watch. But, you know, <laughs> it's just, uh, you know, because they get engaged, I get engaged, and we're all looking for something at the end. And that's uh, what I've been developing. So we've discussed increasing participation in clinical trials and retaining participants in clinical trials during normal circumstances. But we find ourselves in the midst of a very unique situation. So how has recruitment and retention changed during COVID-19? Well, I mean, as a necessity, we've had to adapt to virtual methods, um, you know, for engaging with, with patients regarding clinical research. Um, for the COVID vaccine studies that we were running, we found that we had to, when we had to reach volunteers outside of site databases, um, we did this all in a virtual manner. Um, we had pre-recruitment communities where individuals were signing up online to be notified of a trial if, if one came available near them. Um, we had a, a direct-to-patient outreach campaign where we were able to reach participants in each local geography near our sites. Um, by, you know, we used our predictive analytics and modeling so we could tailor our ad placement and our graphics and, and our messaging strategies to, to Sylvia's point earlier to just be really inclusive and um, make sure that we were delivering the right message to the right patient at the right time, you know, based on what ads were, were working best. And, and we found that we had really various digital marketing channels and, and even direct mail was successful. So we really needed a multi-channel approach um, that went virtual, even our community engagement efforts where they were transitioned entirely 100% to be virtual. 
Um, you know, so instead of holding educational events in, in local community centers and churches, you know, these were now being taking place on Facebook. And, and we had this opportunity because we found that, you know, there was a larger audience now online um, because of COVID naturally, the digital use was increasing. So, so we were able to reach potential participants, you know, virtually um, in that regard. I think with that being said though, we, you have to take into consideration some, 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 I guess, considerations that, you know, that we need to make sure that we're resonating and reaching different audiences in a virtual environment, like the, um, and considering the digital divide and that, as Michael mentioned earlier, not everyone has access to internet service or computers, but most people have cell phones. And so, you know, we want to, maybe we have a smartphone compatible communication strategy and that might be more appropriate and, and more inclusive. And then digital health literacy and understanding a patient's ability to understand and apply the health information that they're finding online to their personal circumstances. And then when we think about decentralized or virtual trial visits, um, being aware of cultural perceptions related to telemedicine. Um, you know, just like our traditional clinical trial models, there's lack of interest, there's skepticism about the researchers, skepticism about the value of the study. And these are all barriers um, to participate in digital health research as well. Um, and then thinking about digital, there's concerns about confidentiality and privacy when, when people have to share their personal information over the internet. So while we're removing logistical and travel barriers to access on one hand, we're facing new barriers as we transition to a digital environment. Um, but I think, you know, looking at that, we can look at care and clinical practice and translate that to clinical trial visits. So we saw during COVID that telemedicine in primary care um, was a necessity, but, but primary care physicians were reporting differences with access to care delivered through telemedicine and specifically a lower proportion of telemedicine visits were being conducted among diverse patients. And so to address these issues, the, the, the physician staff actually called on the phone the patients and walked them through this video application that they needed to um, log into. And this way before you know, they did this before their scheduled visit so that they were comfortable with the technology and able to log in and, and more comfortable with, with a virtual type of visit. And so I think, you know, this type of education for using digital platforms can be translated for virtual trial visits or even for ePros or, uh, or retention portals designed to keep someone engaged with continuing in a study. Um, you know, you can have uh, in-person visit at first if possible and walk that patient through the online platform and, and really help to increase the usability and acceptability of, of that visit or the platforms that have to be used in the trial. And Becky and I actually have a book chapter coming out on this topic. Um, and if you're interested in that, you can email us and we'll put you in, we'll give you the title of that. So using technology to engage people and build trust in online communities is so important. And we're getting to that point where it's almost time for us to take questions. So um, we thought in conclusion, we'd have the panelists um, go around and give some final thoughts about this topic. I guess I'll go first. Um, I think for, for me, what I've had to really um, kind of come to grips with in this work is that there's really no perfection in this process. There's, um, you know, we do these methodical studies, we have these detailed study plans, we've got everything perfect down to the book, you know, to do it. But at the end of the day, like health literacy and interpersonal relationships and all that, there's no one size fits all. There's no one way to do it. There's always going to be more for us to learn. There's an amount of humility that goes into doing this work and doing it well in order to be inclusive and make sure that we're reaching as many people as we can who could potentially benefit from the study. And so I think that I've tried to take this mindset, a growth mindset of staying curious. And when I get feedback, even, you know, we make materials at our center all the time and we're getting patient and participant feedback on them. And, you know, I, I've really shifted over the, the years now to be able to see it less as a setback to the timeline. I build in better timelines now to have feedback integrated more seamlessly, but also 
Um, I don't see feedback anymore as like a critique or criticism. I see it as this opportunity for us to just continue to grow and learn. And that improvement doesn't mean that the thing you developed earlier was not good. It just means you can make it better by integrating more diverse perspectives and making it more inclusive based on the feedback you're getting. So that for me has been my little nugget from my health literacy and clinical research work. Well, well, for me, it's it's been an awesome journey learning from being promoted to the research department and getting to learn about the regulations and the importance of clinical trials, and, you know, the opportunity to see a molecule from a molecule to the animal study all the way to being post-marketed is still fascinating, but it all boils down to the patient, the participant, protecting their safety, their rights, and and making sure that they understand the research study. And also too, very interesting to please report any side, uh, side effects, you know, the adverse events. But again, if you don't tie that health literacy into that piece, then we'll be missing a lot of information. Health literacy and clinical trials are, are, are one and the same. We have to continue to push this model because if we don't, we'll continue to have these same discussions year after year without actually addressing the root cause of the problem. We have to invest in these communities. It's just as simple as that. People want to participate. I truly be believe it. I'd be in the community, but the question is the resources are not there. So we can get big pharma, academia, the hospitals, whoever want to hear us, go into the community, we know where to go, and we can assist you to make sure that we can get these people. Like I said, the 2021 data says that there are 10.9% of Americans who are uninsured. We're trying to get at least half of that right there. And that would do a lot for clinical trials in the future. So thank you. Thanks, Michael. And I think for me, you know, throughout the pandemic and recruiting for COVID trials, we really were able to demonstrate that there is a way to overcome barriers and remove some of these systemic barriers. You know, we were shifting our site selection strategies to find the sites in the right communities that would allow wider access to the study centers. And we were training and preparing sites in new ways. And, and now, as Sylvia has mentioned, you know, more than ever, people are actually aware of clinical research, who's kind of normalized clinical research through, um, you know, not only recruitment efforts, but also all of the media reporting on trials and trial progress. Um, and, and then, you know, industry is now planning um, and designing trials for to be more inclusive. And so in addition to that, I think we, we removed a large barrier in that individuals historically underrepresented in research were actually asked to participate, um, you know, and they, and they said yes. So I think we just need to leverage this current momentum with the awareness that has now been built and really try to create sustainable change towards expanding access um, that it is extending beyond COVID. Thank you, everyone. And I wanted to add, thinking about research differently. And as you can hear, all the panelists use the word participant instead of subject, which is really, really important to me um, because we don't want to think about experimenting on, right? They are participating in a process. And to that point, um, the research that I conducted has been qualitative um, in this area. Um, and one of the things that I would say is include the participants' voice in the findings. We typically have biometric outcomes, right? <laughs> but we need to hear from the participants. And part of that is the way that we ask questions. And so I think my students probably get sick of hearing this from me, but it's taking time about designing the questions we ask in a way that is not leading, that is not biased, that is so open-ended that it provides the opportunity for the participant to speak their voice. And so I think that's really important in thinking about how are we evaluating these studies? And then really just encouraging the students out there, the undergrad, the graduate students, the PhD students to really get involved with this subject um, because you can make a really big difference. Um, there's things that some of these companies, these organizations wouldn't have time to do. And 
sometimes that's the participant's perspective. So I think you can really contribute by getting involved. And I um, think that qualitative is a great way to do it. But of course, there's opportunities for survey research as well. And so um, as we move into the questions, we have a top ranked question right now, which is linked to TeachBack. So TeachBack is so important in ensuring understanding, and this is from Christine Brown. Any recommendations on how you handle doing teach back in clinical trial consents, which are often many pages long? Do you want me to start? Do you want me to yeah. give the crack? Because um, I think Michael, you'll probably have some feedback too, but when we've thought about this in the past, you know, the idea of looking at the consent form and thinking about where there are sort of natural points to break and have conversation, I think is key. And I think another piece of it, just taking a step back, the idea of key information. Now, I know that isn't necessarily in being integrated into every single trial, um, the idea of key information at the beginning of the consent form. But if you take that mindset, though, of thinking about what are the key things that people really need to know about the study to in order to be able to make an educated, uh, sort of informed, empowered decision um, and framing your discussion around those points, sometimes it's more of this layered process, you know, like the idea of going page by page and reading through a consent form with someone is not, it, it depends on the study, right? Some people do that. Some people have, um, have feel that that's necessary for their study. Some people have more of a discussion more broadly and then sort of point to different sections of the consent form. So I, I feel like I'm giving sort of some broad strokes on a few different ways to do it. And I know in the past, like Michael Pache Orlo, who I think is no stranger to many of you here, has, has thought a lot about how we integrate that into consent processes. And um, I, you know, I'd have to see again some of the recommendations if there's anything new that's come out there. But really, I think it's really just thinking about what are the key messages we really want people to understand about a study that they're going to be in? And how can we make sure then that those little bits are getting touched upon and um, taught, taught back to us, right? Communicated back to us. And Michael, you probably are more engaged in consent processes. Maybe you have more to add around the idea. No, I, I just want to concur with your, um, with everything you just stated. I mean, I, would, I was going to say the same thing as well too, but thank you, Sylvia. Becky, do you have anything to add? Well, the only thing I have to add is um, more, if you have the opportunity to use e-consent, sometimes some of those um, prompting and questions is built into that. And there's a place for you know, participants, potential participants to write down questions. If they bring that home, then they can go back to their doctor and talk through that. So sometimes that's already kind of built in um, if, if you can use e-consent. Thank you. Okay. How would you suggest Balancing language, for example, using people with cervixes, cervixes instead of women in recruitment materials, with the fact that a lot of people with lower literacy may not have the awareness. Sorry, it shifted. Awareness about their bodies, for example, but they may not know they have a cervix to know that they are eligible. Read, read that again. I just want to make sure I give a cohes cohesive. I think it's answer. about um, it, it, people who aren't aware of their bodies. Right. How would you help them? Like if there's, you have to have a cervix. How would you, to participate in this trial, how would you help people understand that if they didn't know what that was? Uh, the, wow. the idea of the question. Yeah, well, and you're first, brave for answering that one, Michael. Yeah, I, I know, <laughs> I, I, I know, I know. No, I, I, I just think, that, figure out just who you are, know why you're going into the study and try to get as much information as you possibly can. Now, that's uh, particularly uh, 
not loaded question, but it's a, it's a lot of information there that I can't cohesively give you a proper answer, but any informed consent would tell you this is what the study is recruiting for. Now, if there's anything about uh, body dysmorphic uh, issues or something like that, then that's something else. But I just think that that right there would be in the body of the informed consent for that particular person. Well, the other thing is, you know, testing your messaging or potential messaging and Im imagery with potential participants and, and just seeing and, and hearing. We learn so much by doing this and it actually change our approaches after doing this because that's going to help us understand how to communicate in the way that's going to be, you know, that's going to best resonate and, and people will actually understand. And I just want to add that I really appreciate this kind of question because really just thinking about how we don't necessarily, we're moving to this like idea of binary, like gender being like not really the best way for us to be able to differentiate our, ourselves, right? And so I think this question is getting at that nuance of like, how are we going to be inclusive and make sure, you know, we're reaching, you know, People who have a cervix, who regardless yeah. of what they identify as their gender, um, um, and making sure that they are in feel included because you can have cervical cancer and be, well, you know, and be a well. Well, what about the LGBTQ um, community? You know, so that's another area as well too. You know, because again, you when, when you're looking at um, some of these uh, demographic questionnaires, you know, you're talking about gender, male or female. You know, so that's another issue as well too. Yeah. So test it. Becky was right. <laughs> yeah, test it. <laughs> so Lakeisha Brown has a question. What are your thoughts, plans to promote clinical trials to communities, especially communities that are not well represented in research? Most community people do not know that they themselves can look for trials and therefore wait for a medical provider to bring this up, which doesn't happen often. Mm. Or even where they can begin for such a search? Well, it, it, again, it goes back to my opening statement about, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, you know, they have to invest in these communities because I did a retrospective data analysis of one of the studies that we're looking at. So I, I found this particular medication is for prostate cancer, right? It's called Lupra. So we broke down the numbers and when we really looked at it, there was, about 80% who participated in this, this uh, study before it went to the market for a treatment for um, prostate cancer, over 80% were Caucasian males. And you know, on the flip side, if you look at African-Americans have the highest propensity of prostate cancer and mortality, but only like 7% participated. So that's right there shows you that we have to, Keisha, to your point, invest in the communities, target that area that 10.1% of those uninsured Americans target them so we can get a true uh, sort of analysis of that this medication is actually working for this particular population. We're, you know, we're talking about this now, but we need these pharmaceutical companies to invest. That's the, in academia as well too, to invest. That's the only way we're gonna sort of bend the curve, so to say. So right now I'm working on an evaluation of a community-based needs assessment that was really interesting. And it involved the community stakeholders um, going door to door, contacting members of the community by text message and by phone. So you're getting at everybody, whatever their preference was for communicating. And what was really interesting is that they did the needs assessment, but they also connected people with the resources that were available in the community. So I think that would be an opportunity to promote clinical trial re, uh, participation in these underserved communities. But one of the things that I wanted to mention is to think differently about who our stakeholders are because it, that needs assessment was so successful because the police were involved. And this is a community that worked on building the trust in the police. So they spent, they sent their community health workers out, um, hired people from the community, including um, the, the police and got a good response rate during COVID-19. So mm -hmm. I think that thinking outside of the box um, and getting the community stakeholders involved is really, really important. 
So now, Thomas, who has an overview of how your research fits into a larger picture and not just perform so what research, avoiding a patchwork set of research projects. Mm. I think probably Becky can speak to that. Can you repeat that one more yeah. time? So he wants, to, he wants to know the overview of how your research fits into a larger picture. And Becky conducted a social ecological model research study. She looked at every level. And so I think that's a good approach. It, it has to be social ecological. Um, in order for you to avoid a patchwork set of research projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we look at it, that's a good point. And if we look at it from a socioecological issue, because a lot of times when we're doing research if, um, and we're looking at the barriers, everybody focuses on those individual level barriers, you know, mistrust and lack of awareness and having health literacy. But if we, we can overcome those by looking at you know, interpersonal and physicians communicating effectively, um, or our organizational, um, our organizations, you know, providing the right education, are they speaking the right language? Do they have language assistance services? Are they going out and, and speaking with community members and engaging with, with community stakeholders? Um, you know, and do we have effective public awareness programs when we're looking at a policy level? Um, I'm not sure if that's answering the question. I'm not sure I understand the question completely. But I think I think in saying when you're studying this, it's it's exactly what you said. It's not just looking at the individuals, but the whole system, right? And I think that Becky, while it was a huge project for her dissertation, used the social ecological model to explore minority participation in clinical trials, and so it was um, something that ended up being massive. And to be quite honest, often we don't do those type of studies because we just don't have the resources. We don't have the final financial resources or the, the people to conduct them. But ideally, yes, we have to look at the whole entire community from top to bottom. And so I think that was, you answered what Thomas was asking. Now, Gary has a question. What are your thoughts in value? How do individuals understand the benefits to them? Well, um, um, I would say some of the benefits would be obviously participating in the clinical trial, um, especially going back to that 10.1% of the uninsured um, Americans. Um, you have direct care, uh, you'll be getting a physical exam, EKG, blood work, urinalysis, you'll be getting all that workup. And plus two, you'll be, treat, you know, you'll be, um, have a direct contact with the study physician that you may not have had if you didn't participate in the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. So that is one definitely big benefit of participating in the clinical trial. Well, and and I we, think I, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, no, sir. go ahead, Michael, sorry. You know, because um, briefly, we had a participant who participated for, for his first time for a clinical trial. We discovered that he had uncontrollable hypertension so he thanked us later on, thank you. So now he's being treated, but, but because of his willingness to participate, we found uh, an un undiscovered diagnosis, which he's got getting treated for. Mm -hmm. And I think I might just add that um, it, sort of, it can depend on the study though too. Sometimes there is no direct benefit to being in research and that's kind of part of clinical research as well is that we're contributing to something that's bigger than ourselves and that there's altruism involved. And so I think that idea of how do people understand that, I think it's really important upon uh, and, and on the research uh, investigators and study team to really communicate clearly what is potentially an individual benefit and what might be um, is sort of you know, just the overall like good of being in, tri in trials. And we know from participant experience surveys that altruism is high on the list for reasons people participate. So it's not that it's um, that if there's no direct benefit, people aren't in studies. That's just not the case. And I think I might just add to Thomas's question because I know that the challenge around um, trials is also that, that I think the global picture is like how many studies are happening and are they addressing the issues that are most important? And I think he sp speaks to a larger challenge, which is there is no like 
perfect overarching vision of like what all the studies are happening and where and who are the populations that are being reached and that we've got it all perfectly set up so it's not a patchwork but yet a, a really nice coherent model of research leading to care um it's just not i don't i don't know that it's there yet but it's such a great um question and, and idea so i'm just been thinking a little bit more about it since the question came up Thank you everybody for your questions and that's a wrap for us. We really appreciate it and have a great Memorial Day weekend. Thank you so much for joining us. Bye, thanks. Bye.